All right. So you guys are listening to the Flickers podcast. I'm Jesse Grant, joined here with my co-host, John. I'm John Grant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I just said that. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of like, I was trying to do that thing in Seinfeld when like, um, when they're, when Kramer and Jerry and the, and this guy like pirating the movie and Jerry catches the guy pirating it. And then like uh, Kramer says to him something, he's like, um, what is it? He's a joke maker. Tell him, tell him, Jerry. I'm Jerry's a joke like, maker. I'm a joke maker. <laughs> yeah, like that. That's so funny. I remember. <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. But yeah. Um, so if you guys are joining us today, we've got a really special episode for you guys. Um, mm. We talked to director Florent Bowden, who's directed documentaries on Kareem Benzema, um, Tony Parker, the NBA player, and also French rapper Gims, who's one of the top selling artists, if not the number one top selling artist in the world. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, he shares some amazing insights and it was such a great conversation. What did you think about it, John? Yeah, he was a really, really nice guy. I think it was really good for us to talk to someone who wasn't within the Hollywood mm-hmm. realm of um, of filmmaking, mm-hmm. which it was really refreshing, especially the movies that he he directed um, were really refreshing in, yeah. those, in, that, in that aspect, especially the Gims documentary, yeah. which was like, yeah, very eye-opening. Definitely about a French um, rapper that we don't hear. Yeah, about. just about just get getting out of the whole Western yeah. culture of yeah. of music and celebrity, and watching that film, you really get the idea of um, the world that exists with, with, outside of our own world. Little which is kind of, yeah. yeah, you know, it's kind of weird. Like it, it's definitely it's weird to think that you know these people are celebrities, but there's a whole other world that have celebrities that are probably bigger than the yeah. ones we actually think like about. This guy you know? sell, he makes more money off music than Drake does. And yeah, like, he's, that's he's very big. Yeah. Insane. So um, yeah, you know, it was such an amazing documentary and such an amazing chat and both his documentaries that we talk about in this episode being the Tony Parker one. And also the Gims documentary can be found on Netflix if you guys want to watch it. And the Tony Parker one's pretty cool because he, he's actually the last person to ever have a sit down interview with Kobe Bryant. Um, Mm -hmm. a few weeks before his sad passing which is pretty crazy you know he's got that in documentary but yeah if you guys are here to listen for Florent Bowden and you like the episode feel free to leave a review or follow us on Instagram at Flickers Podcast also on Twitter at Flickers Podcast and subscribe on YouTube at The Flickers so yeah um, without further ado let's get into the episode All right, so we're joined here with Florent Bowden. Um, nice of you to join us today. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for having me. That's all right. Um, so we just wanted to start off with, uh, I was listening to a podcast and, and you said that you started off as a, as a journalist, as a sports journalist. And I was wondering how, um, what compelled you to change and, and move into documentary making um, and being a filmmaker? Uh, I don't think if I... I, I still i don't know if if i if i consider myself as a as a real filmmaker uh for now but uh i can't say i'm one i don't know maybe you tell me uh <laughs> but, but I, <laughs> I i always wanted to be a to be um to be a sport journalist that was my uh, uh my dream when i was a when i was a, a young boy uh, i love sports i love watching uh, uh football basketball anything and um when, when i when i start uh, when I when I start being involved in this uh, kind of industry, I find myself very interesting in uh, long formats, and uh, I was working for that um, TV show. It was like a um, a Sunday show about soccer in France, very popular, the the biggest channel in France every uh, every uh, Sunday morning, and I was doing reports for that show about about football, about soccer, and. Um, and I wasn't very interested in, you know, breaking news or, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the exclusive interviews and, and stuff like that. Of course, I was happy when I was doing one, but I was very more excited about uh, telling stories and going for the background and going for the backstories and, and trying to uh, put emotions in my reports. And, and, and as I advanced, in this, I was like, hey, maybe I could do more of that. Maybe I could, you know, work in long formats. And um, that's that's how it went for me. Were you interested in in the backstories of athletes while while you were growing up? Did you have any 
role models and athletes that you would always research and look into their lives and more more in depth than just watching them play the sport? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I think I was just uh, happy to to watch sports and and of course when when someone has a very good had a very good backstory that was like well I'm, I'm even more into it but I was too young to get interested into uh, into athletes like Muhammad Ali or, or, or people like that because I, I wasn't mature enough to to understand this but I knew when I when I liked a guy and I knew that maybe he was from some places or maybe he had to uh, struggle to be where he is now and I, I was more interested into it and um, so growing up I think like a lot of people of my age we, we were just a, a big fan of Michael Jordan of course mm. if, you, if you like basketball and, and you, you were born in, in the 80s you, 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 you're a fan of Michael Jordan. And we watched the um the Tony Parker documentary. What was it about him that you liked, and how did you get involved? Um, it, it was it was a very very cool experience for me because I'm a huge basketball fan, and of course, when you like basketball in France, you 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 like Tony Parker because he was like a, a all Michael Jordan. He, he was the the French Michael Jordan. <laughs> so. Um, so it was, uh, I was very lucky to, to, to get involved into uh, uh, this documentary because, as I told you, I, I, um, I started being a, a sport journalist. So at first I was, uh, I was in, uh, in the writing um, uh, industry. I was, uh, I was a sport journalist for a um, basketball magazine. So I had like several meetings with, with, uh, with Tony Parker's, but he, he didn't remember me at that time. It was, it was you know, the just... You know, small interviews because uh, he did a lot of uh, interviews like that when he when he was uh, in France, and so I, I always get to follow his career. And uh, um, of course, I, I, I um, I've been a foreign exchange student in the U.S. in Texas at the same time he arrived in the U.S. So it was like kind of a, a nice coincidence. And uh, and uh, when. Um, when um, we decided to do this documentary, uh, I was very excited because I feel and I felt like um, I really know the story and I could really tell the story right. Was being a fan of Tony Parker kind of um, a problem at the beginning to kind of to kind of pull yourself away from just being a fan to get to actually know his story? It could have been a problem. I, w- I was a I was a fan of of. Uh, of his journey because I was I was a fan of him as a Frenchman, but I wasn't a, a fan of him as a basketball player because uh, you know I'm a I'm a Phoenix Suns fan, so ah. of course I hated the Spurs and <laughs> and, he, and um, but of course I I I really uh, respected uh, Tony because uh, of his career because of uh, all he did for France, and the problem was uh, I knew the story very well. Um, I know a lot of French people know the story as well. And so I had to find a way to tell it in a more international way because um, a lot of people um, didn't know all the things we know here in France about Tony. What is... So that's, I think that, that's why the, 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 the main problem for, for this. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, what does Tony Parker... Uh, mean to France and, and before Tony Parker made it to the NBA was basketball that big in France or was it more just about soccer and other sports and and what does he he represent to France um, like I told you he's on, he's on Michael Jordan and um, basketball wasn't as big as it is now because of Tony of course but because also for other players and because I think also of the the, the, the good work that the NBA uh, does internationally um, but it was, it, it was something, basketball was something in France where we had, we had good players before Tony Parker, of course, and he, he learned from these players and, um, we didn't, we didn't really know him before going to the NBA. If you didn't know about basketball at all, you, you wouldn't know that a little French guy, 19 years old, were going to the, to the NBA or going to America. And, and in the, in the documentary, you do such a good job at capturing both, um, the success of Tony Parker and also the the downfalls and the challenges that he faced. Did you find it important to to kind of balance out the player and show the good as much as you show the bad as well? Well, I think that's that's the main point of uh, of a good story. You you don't want to 
you don't want to to read or to to watch uh, uh, something where uh, the the main character is always successful. And uh, of course, Tony has always been considered as an um, underrated player. And I think it was uh, it was something um, not very fair to him uh, because people will always say people still say. Okay, Tony was good, but he had Gino Billy with him. He had Tim Duncan with him. So we wouldn't really know if it was that good. But um, I'm not. I'm not totally cool with that. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. I, because I, I think it would have been uh, it would have been a, a great player anyway. Um, what was your question? <laughs> your question. <laughs> uh, I was just saying, like, well, how, oh how... yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, the the downfall and and the success. Of course, it was very important. That's why I, I, I chose to uh, to break the the um, the, um, the timeline. The, I, I didn't want to to go from point A to point Z. Mm. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, to balance um, the the film with the uh, uh, like you say, uh, success and, and downfalls. Mm. What do you think his biggest um, success was throughout his career? Because, you know, he's, he's done so much and he's met so much to France. What do you think his, was his biggest success? Uh, I think that would be the, the 2007 NBA Finals uh, when, when he, he, he got the uh, MVP award. But I'm sure he would say that would be the, 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 the gold medal he won with, with France at the Eurobasket in 2013. Uh, because uh, they finally um, they finally won against Spain. Uh, that was a huge team at that time, and uh, that was big rivalry. And uh, for him, he really wanted to win with, with France because winning with France was so much harder than winning with the Spurs. Um, and in the inter- in the documentary, you have so many good interviews. And of course, you you interview Kobe Bryant. Um, he comes in about thirty minutes into the documentary. And um, how was it interviewing him? Because I know just even from the first line he says in the documentary, it he seemed like such a good storyteller. Like, um, how fun was that interview? That was great. Uh, that was that was that was a moment I will remember for for my entire life. I think uh, it was complicated at first to get him to the interview because. You know, of course, we were, we were working side by side with Tony, but he wasn't helping that much in getting interviews because he was, you know, he's also like a, a regular person. He don't want mm-hmm. to, to feel embarrassed to, to, to ask people to yeah. interview. So, you know, he, he, he didn't know I, I, I went to, to see uh, uh, some players that maybe not really um, a big fan of Tony and it was also important for me to to get interview maybe from uh, rivals and, 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 and players that didn't go along with Tony like uh, Juan Carlos Navarro from Spain or, or Terry Porter or Derek Fisher uh, all, all these guys and for Kobe um, I, um, I sent I, rem- I, I really remember that I, I sent an email uh, to his uh, production company Mm-hmm. Because I thought that would be a smart way uh, to get him into the movie, and uh, it worked. And we spent six months exchanging emails, and the the guys from there were very cool, and they really wanted to do it. Uh, Tony and and Kobe met at the World Championship in um, in China a few weeks before the interview, so they of course they talked about it a little bit, but they, they talked about so many things. And the funny thing is. Um, I get to the plane to uh, to LA, and when I'm, uh, it's uh, literally the, the the few hours before getting into the plane, I received a mail from um, uh, Kobe's agent saying we cannot do this interview. Oh wow! Uh, I'm not sure uh, you're you're the right person for that. I don't remember what was that. <laughs> uh, I think he thought that I, I I lied at some point. And so I was literally getting into the plane and this agent told me, you cannot do the interview. I think he thought um, his uh, agent wasn't the right agent, uh, the, um, Tony's agent. So I had, um, I called, of course, uh, Tony's agent and, uh, and, uh, and I, I told him to, to call the guy and the guy wouldn't still believe it. So uh, Tony's agent, I, I, I thank him for that. I thank her for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, she just passed the phone over to Tony. 
and she said, okay, just talk to Tony if you don't if you don't believe me. And so they said, okay, cool. And so we did the interview. But uh, and then the interview, of course, was great because uh, Kobe at that time was very busy. So he was always busy, even if he was not playing. He was involved in so many things. And so we set up all all of uh, uh, gears and and lights and stuff, and uh, we did. I think 30 minutes, that was very wow. short, but all the, all his answers were like so powerful. And uh, like you said, the, the, the first question I asked him was, uh, can you introduce yourself and, uh, and tell me your, your link and your relationship with uh, Tony Parker? And he, and he said this uh, great line, uh, uh, I am Kobe Bryant, I play against Tony for years and he's responsible for me not winning more championships. So. <laughs> Going from there, I was like, okay, it's going to be a, a good interview. How long is the research um, for a documentary like this? Like getting all the archi- going through all the ar- archival footage and lining up all the, um, the interviews with all these athletes. How long does that take? It could be long. It could be very long, but it was very quick because we needed to do it very quickly. <laughs> uh, that's just, uh, you, 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 don't, you don't really know how much time you will have. And for this documentary, it was very particular because I was working on another documentary for, uh, because I, I, I'm a, an employee in a production company and, and we do documentaries. So I'm very lucky because I had like, so many projects coming to me. And so I was working on this uh, Netflix original about a French rapper uh, called Gims. Mm. Um, so everything was very cool. I was like following him, doing interviews and, and we were traveling the world with him. And at the same time, we, know, we knew that we had this project about Tony, but it was a little bit blur because Tony Parker was very interested in working with us in documenting maybe his last season but he wasn't sure yet that it was his last season so we we're like okay we well, maybe we'll see some we'll, we'll see if we could do something and um the season went and it was like so do you want to film something or uh, what's going on so we decided okay we need to shoot but the, the documentary wasn't sold yet so we needed to, uh, to, to shoot with uh, our own funds, our own money. So you don't want to do that <laughs> when you're a production company. And, uh, and of course, I was busy with the other documentaries, but I was like, okay, I can handle this. I know the story very well. It's very clear in my mind. We're, we're, I need this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. I need this archive, this archive, <laughs> this piece of archive. And so uh, that's, that's how it went. And finally... Uh, the pandemic struck and uh, Netflix, who wasn't interested at first, asked us to do it and to edit it in one month. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I can't even get off my house and I need to, uh, to do a documentary. I didn't even finish shooting because I wanted to shoot so many other stuff. But that's how it goes also in this industry. You need, you need to, to, to make up for the best. And, uh, and when um, Netflix asks you for a Tony Parker movie, okay, you need to deliver a Tony Parker movie and uh, you need to focus on your strength. I know I had like a big interviews with Tony, with Kobe, with the Spurs organizations uh, players. I, I knew it's going to be good. I knew I, I, I had some very cool moments in, with this family and uh, very emotional. So I know I could do something, but I didn't know I could do it that fast. And so, of course, it was a, it was a, it was a very helpful to know Tony's stories. And I, I, I could tell you that some stuff uh, uh, I put in the movie was just memories. And I was like, I'm sure <laughs> there's something in this paper about this, and I'm sure we're gonna find it. <laughs> and you talk about like how um, you were kind of rushed to, to make the documentary. How much of being a director is about compromise and you know having to get the product out on time as well as you putting out your own vision? That's, that's the whole point, I think, for me of being a director, that's uh, making decisions. And uh, of course, sometimes you work with people uh, behind cameras, uh, people, um, uh, beyond computers uh, editing and they, they're not happy when, when what you get and you're like man that's where we need to do it with that and sometimes uh, you, you, you're you not happy with you, you don't have the sound you want in the interview you don't have like the, the lighting you want but you have to do with it and uh, of course you try to do the best as you can and you try to put your vision in it 
and you try to to uh, uh, I, I I like to put emotion. I like to 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 make people to drive people to certain directions and uh, and you need to do what what the with your um, uh, w w what you have in your hands and mm -hmm. uh, and that's your point of being a director because in documentary you are always have to adapt yourself that's that's the point and because you got cut um kind of short because of the pandemic and netflix wanting um the documentary so quickly did you have any any ideas of what you wished you could have got or what you would maybe um were were planned to do for the documentary that you couldn't end up doing was there anything that you were going to do that um that i, I knew short? that I knew that um, we we had some good stuff, some very good stuff. Like I told you, especially to uh, to tell it um, for an international audience. Mm. I really wanted to to do um, a nice portrayal of uh, Tony Parker in America. That that's why my that, that's why my. But I think uh, I could have like had so much stuff in France. I, I would have like to do more stuff with him in France because we could have done that. That was, it was always a thing like, okay, that's easy to do. Let's do mm -hmm. it later. But then at the end I got caught up and I was like, oh damn, maybe we could have done more stuff with him in France. And of course you always want to, to add like um, stars characters in it. And mm -hmm. I was, I, uh, I, I was supposed to do interviews with other players like Jason Kidd, oh. Dwayne Wade, Wow, uh, we we were uh, that that that's still uh, bad to think about it because I, I, <laughs> I thought it would it would have been great to have these players and I was very close to uh, to get LeBron James. Uh, oh I wow! Mean, to, to, I, I didn't know um, honestly if uh, it would accept because I didn't see him talking in other documentaries for like ages now. Mm. But uh, we were negotiating, and um, so. Of course, you could always do better movies. You could always do better work. Uh, but like I told you, you have to do what with what you have and, and the condition. And we didn't have that much money, and so we we needed to do the best film as we as we could. Mm. And what was it? Oh, you go, Jesse. No, no, you go. It's fine. Oh. I was going to say, um, it's kind of on like a lighter note, but what was his house like? Because you go to his house and he's got these massive slides and stuff like that. Did you get to go on the slide? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to the slide, but his house was very, very, very cool. It's, it's surprising because um, San Antonio is a surprising city. It's, uh, it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's huge. It's like so many, um, so many houses for kilometers. And uh, uh, he's kind of... Uh, 30 minutes one hour away from the city and uh, he, he i think he built his dream house you yeah. know with a he's got a zoo uh, he's got <laughs> like, <laughs> like you say like uh, water slides and uh, uh, basketball courts of course tennis courts and uh, uh yeah i think he, he, he wanted to show up he wanted to uh, <laughs> to, to, to to live his dream but it's uh, we were very lucky because he didn't uh, at first he didn't want to as to show show his house from um, from the um, from the sky, you know, with a mm. drone shot, mm. because he said, you know, um, in France people are very shy about money and they, they don't like to talk about it, and it's it's true. And if he showed that, um, people would judge him and would say, oh, okay, he just, he would just want to show off and 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 show show us his money. And uh, I convinced him, and uh, I told him that it was, you know, it was international, it was Netflix, so we, we could show that, and people will like it. They would say, "Wow, that's amazing," and they won't say, uh, "Oh, this guy would just want to show off." I think I think the documentary did that so well. It showed um, with his dad being American and his mum being French. It really showed well his almost two sides. You know, he's got the unashamable confidence of the American, and and also the. Uh, the kind of keep yourself grounded and, and stay humble from, from the French side. And I think that's what the documentary did so well. It really captured him, you know, even as a player, I think it reflected in his game. Sometimes he would do things that were a little more flashy and had a little more character than what Tim Duncan would be like um, or Ginobili, but he also stayed quite reserved. And, and so, yeah, I think that's what the documentary did, did really well. I was I think I was going to say, you touched on it earlier. You had, um, 
you talked about you doing your other documentary, Gims, and, and was that shooting at the same time as Tony Parker? Almost at the same time. Uh, right. I, I started shooting Gims a little earlier. Uh, we spent, uh, I think it was a year and a half shooting with him, you know, going on tour. And, and uh, I don't know if you, if you, uh, if you saw the, the yeah, documentary, we- but um, uh, we, it was, it was more easy because it was uh, the, 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 um, how, how would I say that? Um, the path was more clear. You mm. know, we all, all, all the deal were, 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 the deal was sealed with the, uh, with Netflix and uh, we, we knew what we needed to do, but it was, it was a big challenge for me because that was the first time I did a documentary on, um, on, um, on a singer and it was it, on a popular singer, especially it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it was totally new war for me. So I had to put a lot of effort in uh, understanding the business and, and and do a lot of uh, I did I did a lot of research. Uh, I read a lot about him, and uh, because also I wanted to give like a historical um, uh, background to to his story with the, his links uh, to uh, Congo and uh, the the music there. And so it was it was it was hard to do, but it was easier in a way that um, I knew where I was going. With the Parker documentary, it was like. Um, on the side project you know, yeah right. let's do that and we'll see if it happens you know <laughs> and uh, you don't really like to be involved in the situation because you might end up with like very good stuff and nobody will see it because nobody wants to pick it and and you kind of had like a, a rare situation where your Tony Parker can't, uh, documentary ended but then you had games at the end of the Tony Parker documentary I mean that's pretty lucky to kind of have them sync up together is that <laughs> intentional in any way uh, I I don't know if it was intentional, but I remember I was with San Antonio with Sony. We were shooting. Um, it wasn't the, the 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 last scene you saw. It was other stuff. I I went there three times, I think. Um, and um, and I told him about games. Uh, I told him, uh, hey, I'm almost done with the uh, documentary uh, I do for for Netflix. It's on games. He was like, oh, cool. I like games. It's very cool. My my sons like them. I never met him, but my, my sons really liked him. And I was like, oh, do you want me to <laughs> make the contact? And uh, uh, he was like, yeah, sure. Because I, I'm thinking about inviting a singer uh, for my uh, big um, ceremony party. I was like, well, man, you should just uh, call him and uh, <laughs> see uh, if it can happen. And it happens. And the funny thing is, I was uh, editing um, the games um, documentary and uh, we were um, having thoughts about uh, showing games on tour in the US uh, for the end of the, uh, of the movie. Um, because we were like, okay, that's Netflix, that's international, like, like I told you. We, and, and games was on tour in the US at that time. So that's why the, the uh, Tony and games connected because it was in LA and there was a ceremony at the same time. I think the next day it was in Dallas. So it was like, okay, you just come to my party, you do a show and then you could go do your show in Dallas. I think it was in that order. Um, of course, it's easier with a private jet, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that would help, yeah. <laughs> and um, I, so I was like, okay, I need to 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 get pictures of games. I need to film games in the US. So I went. I sent a crew to LA to to follow him to his concert in LA. And of course, when a, a singer from another country go to big city like that, you know, it's it's always very small concerts. You know, with all the um, the, the population from his country coming is and um, mm-hmm. no American went there. It was only, you know, French people living in LA going to games concert. But anyway, and uh, the, 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 I think the, the footage was good, but it was like not as good as we did in France with him or in Morocco. Or, and then so we were like, we don't really need to show games in the US. That's not the point of the film. But the funny thing is had uh, my crew following him in his jet coming to Tony Sparker party and filming and singing in Tony Sparker party. And I had my other crew from the Tony Parker's movie <laughs> with me 
in Tony Parker's house, filming Tony Parker's <laughs> party. So the, the, we were like, hey guys, hey, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> so that so was like like directing two two documentaries for Netflix at the same time. That was pretty crazy. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, and I was gonna say because because we watched the the Gims documentary as well, and um, with you saying you didn't want to, you ended up not showing um the American footage and the U.S. tour footage. I actually, I quite like that um, you didn't because I do like how uh, towards the end of the of the film, Gims even says, when I was younger, I'd try to tailor to the American audience and be like an American. And then I, I was like, hey, we, we're actually bigger than the American industry and, and I need to be me and who I am. And um, I really liked that because I thought it was a very refreshing um, take on celebrity and a musician that I hadn't heard about until watching the film. But uh, I kind of wish I did because especially in the Western world and we only hear about American musicians and stuff when there is so many other countries and such a big music industry that we're missing out on. And I thought um, it was really cool how you were able to uh, put that in the documentary. Was that were you consciously thinking to put that in the documentary and to show that um, there is a bigger international music industry? Yeah, and that that's exactly why we didn't show the, the American part, because we had that part very powerful. And uh, we were like, we cannot say that. And at the end, as a bonus, like show games in the US, that was our first intention, like to be like a bonus, you know, and, mm. you know, you do the, the big concert and then like two months later and you, you saw him like in a beach in LA and, you know, doing a small concert and, you yeah. know, like, like the tour never stops. That was, that was our goal. But we were like, oh, let's just stop it at the concert. That would be more powerful. And um, it's very interesting because when we shot him with uh, Maluma, the, the, the Colombian uh, singer, I realized that the music industry changed a lot. And um, um, America is not the leader anymore of the music industry. And if you saw this um, singer from Latin America, like Maluma, He's, he yeah. does like, billions of views Huge, on, yeah. uh, on YouTube uh, in Spanish, not even in English, in Spanish. So it's, it, it was, uh, and Games is very aware of that. That's why he does uh, this kind of uh, a song with uh, um, inviting uh, people from other countries. He did it one with uh, J Balvin as well. Um, and he's very big in Africa, of course, and uh, also in the Arabic world. Uh, because of course he lives in Morocco, he, uh, he converted to Islam and he is often in, in Dubai, in Qatar and doing show there and uh, even in Asia. And, um, and to be honest, he told me also that he wasn't very um, good with singing in English. It was like for him, like losing a bit of his personality. So mm -hmm. uh, I think he, he, he chose another way another strategy to be on top because he's, he's also a very good businessman and he want to be on top. And so that's, that's the way he, um, he decided to do it. But of course, I'm sure if, if he could have uh, a career in the U S he would have taken it. That's, that's <laughs> sure. But yeah, because personally um, I thought it was so cool because as a kid uh, I, I lived overseas a lot and I lived in Dubai and I lived in Abu Dhabi and um and China. And so it, it was cool to see, cause I hadn't really seen a documentary on any musicians from tailoring to those audiences. And so I thought it was, it was really cool personally to see that. Yeah. And it was also a part of, a, of, a, of the Netflix strategy, you know, games was the, the first uh, French uh, documentary for Netflix, like the first wow. original wow. Netflix documentary. So, and it, they were, they were like very, very honest with us. They were like games is number one in France. And we want to know the number one and that's mm. it. And then we were like, oh, but you don't know the backstory. You don't know he's from Congo. You don't know he lived in the street in France and you didn't know like he could rap, but also he could sing and he was like, perfect. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the first thing was we, we want the number one because we want to enter the French market. We, want, they, they, we were just opening uh, the, the French office in Paris. Mm. And so they, they, they wanted to, to do a big documentary um, in France with a French artist. And uh, so, uh, again, we we're very lucky to, to do that one. Yeah. One, one of the like, best moments in the, in the documentary, I reckon, was um, when you took him back to the Congo and you got to go back to his, his old neighborhood where he grew up. Um, can you speak about like what that what that was like filming and how humbling that was to him? And uh, that was a very cool moment. And um, to be to be honest, I missed it. 
because I wasn't there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, so that's that's a big bummer. But uh, that's also part of uh, of how you how you do movies. Uh, we we shot that in 2017, I think, because we get in touch with Gims and his entourage, and uh, uh, he told us that he was doing his first concert in Congo by himself uh, to his uh, hometown. And um, my boss said, let's just send a crew there. And, and they said we could film whatever we want. And so we picked like a very good DP and he went there by, by himself with his camera and uh, he shot all of the great scenes you see. And uh, we, we made the deal with Netflix uh, a year later. So, oh. so that, that, that could have been a footage Nobody, uh, yeah, you know, like, yeah. Like, like I told you before. Wow. And, and of course, uh, the, the, the guy was focused on, on games. So I needed to, to have so many additional shots to do that. So I told myself, hey, maybe we could go back to Congo, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, and that wasn't uh, in the plan of, uh, of uh, games, uh, the, the year we were following him, because, you know, the situation is kind of complicated there. And he talked a little bit about it, you know, mm. what he wanted to do for, for his own population. But it's very hard for him to go there and, and be safe in a way that he could do stuff like he wants to do stuff. Mm. So um, I, I sent a, a crew based in Africa to do all the shots about the streets, uh, the, the, the drone shots of the, the palace of Mobutu and stuff like that. And uh, we, we mix. The, the two footage to, to, to tell the, the, the Congo stories. And of course, I had a very um, good um, person to, to look for archives and, and to find, you know, um, footage of his father singing on stage and, and stuff like that. So, so you were filming that before Netflix picked it up? You wanted exactly. to film the story? So um, were, you, were you aware of his backstory and his, his life growing up um, before you started filming or did he come to you or someone from his team come to you and ask you to make the documentary? Uh, like I told you, uh, we, we were talking with, uh, with this crew uh, in 2017 and yeah. uh, we were like, you know, we, 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 we knew that games were, was huge and, uh, and uh, he had like this very successful band uh, section that's so mm-hmm. um, also. And so he's, he's been in a picture for, for years and, and, you know, when, when a crew approach you, a crew like that approach you you, you, you try to, to to work something with them and so we were talking and uh, uh, actually they were talking with my boss and then they, they told him about this concert in Congo so that's that's how he went um, that was the the starting point of uh, us deciding to do a documentary and then my boss was contacted uh, by Netflix because Netflix was opening a, a, an office in France mm. and uh, they asked him, what can you do for us? We want to do like a big French documentary. And so he was like, hey, I already have like some golden piece of games in Congo and we could tell you all the story. And then he asked me if I was interested in uh, directed it. I was like, man, that would be amazing. But I didn't know anything about games <laughs> except, you know, the, um, the, the, the song and the, and the, yeah. and the yeah. rare interviews it did because it's very mysterious and, you know, with the, the glasses and stuff. And um, so I had to do uh, my research. And uh, when I learned that uh, he came from Congo and, uh, and he had to live in the street of Paris and uh, all those things, I was like, okay, we, we had something very good here. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the challenges in getting um, people to open up when you're interviewing them about sort of difficult parts of their life? It's, um, yeah, like what are, what are the challenges that, and do you have any tips or tricks to kind of getting them to opening up? Uh, I think I would say you need to make them know that you saw stuff that usually people won't notice. <laughs> I don't know if it's very clear, but uh, I did the, the, the big interview with Kim's at the very end of our journey together. Like uh, I was just following him behind my, my camera guys and we were not talking a lot because I wanted to get a lot of stuff because I was very um, not comfortable with the situation because I didn't know the industry. I didn't know the music mm. industry. I didn't know what part of uh, what part would be good to shoot or not. So I was shooting, shooting. I was like, anytime he was in a, I don't know, dressing room on stage rehearsal or stuff, I was shooting, shooting. So we could have talked like off the camera a lot. 
And um, during that time, I saw a lot of stuff going on. I saw how he was, you know, talking to other singers. I saw how he was with his family members. I saw he was with his wife. And all this stuff I brought him back to him during the interview when we decided to do the interview. And we talked for five hours. Wow. And we did it like in two times, uh, wow. two parts. We, we, we took a break to, to have lunch. And, um, and he opened up like that because yeah. he knew also that he's going to be like a good one because I show him like some stuff we shot. It was like, wow, that's, that's great. And also he knew that it was Netflix. He knew that it was international. And so he, he was very aware of all of that. He, 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 he called a barber right before the interview, you know, because he was <laughs> like, oh, this, this stuff is going to stay forever. So I need to get like, you know, the perfect cut. And uh, little detail like that. But then when I brought back um, all the stuff that we did in shooting with him and, and, and ask him about stuff, it, it was very um, responsive because he, 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 I think he knew that, that I saw stuff that usually people don't see. And uh, that, that would be my advice, like to, to, to be very careful in, in watching stuff going on when you when you do a biography uh, documentary because um, the, the 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 people will like that I think yeah and, and I, the, the good example is you know when I get to the to award ceremony with him that's that's opening on the film usually you get there and you know singers sing and uh, and um, and they get prizes uh, but when you go there and you see all these you know singers like being very, I don't know, shady and, you know, uh, you, you have like all these weird atmospheres. I was like, it, it's not even close to sports. It's like, you know, they look at each other and you, you, you see something special. And so I wanted to, to tell him about that because, you know, whole world ceremony is not very interesting. I think the, 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 um, the back of it, the, the hotel rooms, the dressing rooms, the whole, yeah. the, the people met and all this um, little secrets about the industry were mo much more interesting to, to dig in than the actual ceremony. Yeah. And, and I found it was very refreshing to see uh, a documentary on someone, on a celebrity and someone involved in show business that didn't actually uh, glorify show business and, and, and romanticize it in a way. You, you really showed how he has to put on a, a face that's not really him when he's out in the public eye and also put on the, the sunglasses and and when he pretends to be the security guard for his wife. Um, and I think it did really well at showing that it's not really a enjoyable, you know, you, you kind of have to have to fake it. And, and I really found it was a very good balance. Did you consciously try to do that in the documentary? Yeah, I really wanted to do that. And of course, because also that's the reality and you, you know, when you, when you're a filmmaker and you, uh, you do documentary, you, you, you need to, to, at some point, of course you need to have a vision, but at some point you need to, to, uh, to stick with reality because that's what you want to show first. And uh, Gims is, uh, is, a, is a character mm -hmm. and uh, um, he's not the, the same guy when he's, when he's, uh, he's not Gims and he's, uh, and he's, uh, he's, he's himself and he's with his kids. And, and he, he, he also likes a lot um, the, the manga culture, mm -hmm. you know, with characters and stuff. He was a huge fan of... Um, of uh, not Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, well, anyway, you know the, the <laughs> Dragon uh, Ball Z. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dragon Ball Z. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that that that's for sure. But you know your heroic fantasy uh, also, and uh, Game of the Thrones and all the oh, yeah. right, right. things. And so he really enjoy you know being like a character. And so when he's in, he, he's in public, he, he, he likes to do that, but it's also a way for him to, to get away um, um, from, um, from the audience. So that's why he, he doesn't show his eyes because he, he wants to keep that for him and for, uh, for his uh, private life. In watching both of the films, you, um, you get to see kind of like the Tony Parker one has this very calm demeanor, kind of mirrors himself. And the games one is very energetic and kind of mirrors him, him, his character as well. Would you say that's like your directing style when you go to each subject is to kind of mirror the person that you're, um, you're, you're focusing on? 
Um, that's a good question. I didn't really have time to think about that because, <laughs> you know, I was making the two at the same time and it was very, and I needed to, to, to get it done very quickly. Um, the, the one thing I want for sure, um, the, the one thing I wanted for sure with these two documentaries, I wanted them to be inspiring for, 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 for young people watching it. And so I think I needed to find uh, different ways uh, in, in showing that with, uh, with the, the, the two main subjects because they were very different. Uh, Tony is very different from Gims. Uh, Gims is, is very more comfortable in telling stories. He can sit like well, five hours telling his life. And you know, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you um, succeed in, in catching him and, and, uh, and letting him know that he, he need to sit down from, for five hours, then it's golden, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, but uh, Tony is, is more used to do interviews and short interviews. So he was, he, he, he was like doing very short answers and, and it was like, bam, bam, bam. And, and, he, and he needed to get it done. And Tony wants to understand everything. When you, he enters a room with cameras, why are you shooting? Mm. Why are you shooting that? What do you want to show? So, the, the, the two process were, were very different. And uh, Gims didn't really care that he didn't know me, he didn't know my background. Uh, he, he trusted me very, very quickly. Uh, Tony asked me a lot of questions. He tested me a lot. He wanted to know if I, if I knew basketball. And uh, it, was, it was very cool. And I, and I get closer to Tony than to Gims, but um, Tony was more demanding. Mm. And- and like you said, you know, you get there and, and you can get a sense of how the person is um, with Gims being such a mysterious character and like liking to keep himself away. Um, was it sometimes tough to, to shoot certain things? Did he, did he ever kind of turn around and say, oh, no, don't shoot this? Or, um, or like you said, was he just completely open the whole time and, and very comfortable? No, he, he, he never told us uh, not to shoot, but he was well aware that he was not right. going to be on air like the next day so mm -hmm. it was like we'll talk about it later you know if we if we shoot something like uh, maybe odd for for him or for us it was like oh, don't worry um the 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 film is not going to come up like uh next week maybe you, you know when you when you get some some secrets about a song or you know they, they, they're talking about stuff and you know sometimes you could have like people going to the camera and say oh, oh man uh, this thing is coming up next month i'm not supposed to say that on, on camera mm -hmm. but it was like, oh, don't worry, man. Maybe that will be on like in two years. So um, that was very helpful. And like I told you, he, 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 he trusted us uh, very quickly. Um, and he thought at some point that he uh, controlled us, you know, it was <laughs> like, uh, uh, so that, that's, that's also an advice for documentarians. Um, um, make, make your subject comfortable, make him the king. And uh, uh, afterwards, you, you have to deal with him uh, because, of course, he, he, he would like to know what's in the movie. But if he's very confident, he will, he will just open, open himself very, uh, very more easily. Mm. And as a filmmaker, I know you don't call yourself a filmmaker, but I'm, I'm going to call you. I can call myself a filmmaker. <laughs> don't, be a filmmaker. That, that, don't please me. No, I'm just saying that because I didn't go to film school. You know, yeah. I, 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 went to, uh, I went to journalism school. So I, I still consider myself as a journalist, but I, I, I really wish and I really want to, to, to be considered as a filmmaker. Well, you definitely have a talent as a filmmaker. And, and so as a filmmaker, uh, going into a documentary, of course, you have a vision of how you want it to go. Um, once you get there shooting, and, and like you said, you didn't know a lot of the backstory about Gims, um, how much does that vision change? And do you have to adapt as you're filming and constantly change your vision to suit the footage that you're getting? You don't have to change your vision, but you definitely have to adapt yourself to, to situation because you could get like very cool moment and maybe that will emphasize a part of your vision or, or, or uh, that would um, um, say the opposite. So, and you, you need to show that as well, but that's, that's the, the, um, that's the key of editing. I think I really I like to be uh, uh, editing I, I don't know how to do it very good myself so I'm lucky to have like very good editors with me and that's uh, that's that I really like being in the editing room because we could do like so many stuff with uh, and go so many different ways 
and of course I have I have my my plan you know have I, I I'm I'm a I'm, I'm a handy guy so I'm I, I like to write things on the walls and stuff so we have like all this bunch of papers flying around and uh, I like changing it you can change it you you can you can change it all the time and uh, you can see it. don't don't be afraid to change it you know and, and and uh, sometimes it will make it, if you have time, you could do that. And sometimes it will, it will get better because you, you, you're changing your, 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 your point of view, changing your, the, the timeline of your movie. And, and um, yeah, and, and it won't, I, I won't say it won't change your vision because you, 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 you know what story you want to tell. You just want to tell them the, the, the more powerful way. Yeah. And would you say like... Um... Were there any other like stories that Gims gave you that you couldn't put into the movie that you wanted to, or um, yeah, oh, yeah, just, for yeah. sure, there are so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there is a there, there was a, like a great story about him. And the, the, oh, I will start with that. Um, <laughs> the difficulty is when you do a movie about someone very well known that it will happen so many stuff in his life, like during the the shooting so many stuff like in one week that will be maybe two years of your life you know <laughs> with all the stuff <laughs> happening like he's traveling all the time he could be in paris and then in dubai in morocco and just that is crazy to me and then he will do like so many interviews and of course he will take uh holiday breaks he will he will have like some amazing meeting you know with the king of morocco or i don't know j balvin and it could be like in LA just for two days and then coming back. So you have to make choices, you know, you know, you cannot be everywhere with him and you cannot tell Well, you can tell the, this kind of story, but that it could get boring at some point. And um, I think uh, at one point he had like a break and he was in Corsica for a, a vacation and he was on a boat and uh, the boat caught on fire and he had to jump in the water and swim with his brothers and his uh, uh, manager. And they were, <laughs> they were like swimming to reach the shore and, uh, and uh, local people found them. And it was like, you know, six or seven black guys, you know, with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were coming to the coast, you know, and they were like in swimming suits and, uh, and people were just like, what's going on? And, and things, <laughs> James told this story to another brother. He didn't know uh, the, the, the story when he was waiting for a show and we filmed that and he told the story so well. It was like nine minutes and I couldn't cut anything <laughs> because it was like very, very, uh, um, how do I say that? It, it was so lively, you know, it was like uh, doing impressions and you know and <laughs> and talking about like these guys seeing like five black dudes uh on the coast and they were like uh thinking maybe they are refugees or something <laughs> <laughs> they, they swam from another country <laughs> and it was like also at, at, at another it was very pissed because um because he lost his phone and on on his phone you got all you know the things that he, he does you know to 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 work on his songs so that he was very pissed about that and so he told the story so well and was like, okay, I have nine minutes of pure gold and I'm not going to put it in the movie. Why? Because the story happened like in a certain um, uh, date and uh, it was like on the news for friends for like three, two or three days. But if you show that like a year or two years later of maybe in 20 years, because the movie will, will still mm. be on Netflix, we signed for 70 years. <laughs> which is crazy. And, uh, and, and so maybe the story won't, won't get as interested. I don't know. And so we had to cut those kind of story that well, for us, it was um, uh, too uh, uh, related to news. Like he had some also had some beef with uh, other rappers or singers in France and uh, he talked about that, but we say, well, what happened if in two years he, 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 he makes a song with him? Yeah. That, yeah. that would look stupid in the movie. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not a, our story. And, so and, that, that's some little examples of, uh, of all the good stories we had to, to put back. And in the film, it shows how uh, competitive he is at award shows and with music and even with his brother. Um, mm -hmm. That to me, like whenever I see a documentary on an artist, it's rare to show their competitive side. It's usually all about the music and all of that. And, and so I like the way it showed his competitive side. And um, did, did any stories come up? Like you said, he had beef with other rappers. Was that all competitive based? Like, oh, that person 
um, did did better than me on this song. Did that happen a lot? And did he get angry about that stuff behind the scenes? It, w- it was mainly about uh, about um, numbers. Right. That's, that he's obsessed with numbers. Mm. He wants to be the first. So you don't know you can uh, you can argue about numbers because you have like physical discs, but you of course not so many. But Gims is very liked also by uh, older people, so it will still uh, uh, wow. sell wow. this. Uh, and uh, you you also have the the streaming platforms and stuff. So uh, he, he, he accused one of the uh, very famous French rapper to to buy his uh, his streams uh, on 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 some mm. platforms. So, um, so started a little war between those two. And um, yeah, it's it's very competitive, as you said. And uh, like I like I said before, is is a businessman and he's a genius in music. I think he could do very, very good in in music, like in for for a niche. Mm. Uh, like he could he could do like so more complicated uh, tunes, but he's interested in in uh, in touching um, the, the the whole world. So he, he, he will he will do like very um, calm, um, simple hits, but it's very hard to 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 do a hit and uh, and. Um, yeah, he, he wants to be number one, and so the the competitive competitiveness. That's all you yeah. said. Yeah. He, he, he he has to be on it. He has to be on it because he and and he embraces it. He's really he's really proud of that. Mm. And just finally, before we finish, I know, like you said, you've grown up super into sports. Um, if there's a documentary, a dream documentary you could make, uh, what would it be? Oh, good question. Um, I don't really know if there is a dream documentary to make. It's always like good occasion, and uh, and I think you could always like find a way to tell the story you want to tell. Mm. Um, and I I I, I don't. I'm, I think I'm afraid of the the blank page. You know, I'm, I I would I would rather like someone uh, tell me, okay, can you do a documentary about that guy? Right. And then right. I could I could see if what I can do. Uh, the thing I really wanted to do is a docu series, and I did one oh. uh, for a French TV. So uh, I'm I'm sorry, guys, you 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 cannot watch that. Maybe <laughs> if we, we, maybe if we um, if we sell it internationally, maybe that would be the case. Because was that uh, Champions? Yeah, Champions. Right. Uh, the the uh, it just came out on French uh, French television. It's on a, on a French platform uh, called a uh, uh, French TV. And um, um, it, it, I think it's gonna go to some festivals, and we we might sell it internationally. So I'm I'm very hopeful for that because that that was a very very challenging project. Uh, we were following eight athletes, um, um, young athletes. They were training in the in the um, in a center in Paris at, uh, for Olympic sports. Uh, uh, all the best French athletes are there. Uh, that's that's where Tony Parker um, uh, started his, uh, oh, okay. his uh, journey, the INSEP. And uh, it's very funny because I have uh, two uh, athletes related to Australia in oh. this uh, docu-series. Yeah, I have a, a French-Australian uh, athlete. He's uh, 19 years old and he's very good in uh, uh, sprinting, hurdles, and uh, pole vault. His name is uh, Sasha Zoya. You wow. should uh, look him up because he, he, he did some... Uh, Good stuff in Australia too. He lived in uh, Perth, okay. so uh, so we, we we shot there uh, with him uh, for the docu series, and uh, I, I follow the basketball players too, uh, like like Tony. He like, remind he remind me of uh, of, of Tony because he, he started his uh, journey to to the NBA, and uh, he decided to uh, to join the Australian league next season. Oh, uh, his name is uh, Usman Dieng, and he's going to play for the New Zealand Breakers. Oh wow! Uh, okay. Next next season, and uh, so it was it was very challenging that, that to to answer your question. I don't think there is a dream documentary I want to do, but I know I want to. There is some form, uh, some forms of right. documentary I want to do. I wanted to do biography documentaries. I think mm-hmm. I, I, I I did that. I wanted to do a docu series. Yeah, I did that. So I don't know what I'm going to do next, but uh, I really like, um, I really like the documentary with a lot of archives. I think mm-hmm. they're really interesting. I really like um, 
uh, if it, uh, obviously the the Maradona documentary, the, right. the Amy Winehouse documentary, you know, mm -hmm. all based on archive. I think the right. the name of the uh, British director is uh, Asif Kapadia. I really like his uh, his work, and uh, that that would be a dream to do a documentary like that. You know, only based on archive, and then you you tell your story, you tell your vision about the subject, only based on on the material. Uh, yeah. you already have yeah, that, that that would be very challenging i hope i could do that someday that would be sick um look thank you so much for joining us today thank you uh, it was a real pleasure to have you on thank you very much thanks for having me that that's uh, that's very nice from you guys and uh and i think um it's very good what you do uh you know to to tell people about all the all those movies i've been listening to to some of the episodes and oh. I, I really like you know the 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 talent and you know the the, the atmosphere on, on your show and it's, it's very cool and it's very inspiring you know when you when you when you hear someone talking about how to make movies and how what is he like in doing it or he doesn't like and and i think it could uh, maybe help some people to uh, to get confident um, in this industry because uh, the imposter syndrome is very mm. very huge in this industry and people yeah. who always you know a big challenge and be like ah man can i really do that would they let me do that and uh, and of course if you if you um if you're insecure you, you need to get advice and i think your podcast could be a, a nice way to to get the uh, confidence and uh, and again uh, strength from the other cool that's what oh, we want to do so thanks very so nice. much. <laughs> thank <you. laughs> that's a very big compliment coming from you so thank you no, no, that, that, that's very sincere you're welcome